welcome to yet again another live discussion um, of the Alec Murdoch trial. Um, I'm here with Luke and Brian Sheely, um, the namesake of the Sheely Law Firm. Luke and Brian are twins from South Carolina. That's right. Um, the Sheely Law Firm is located in Columbia, South Carolina, as well as Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, my name's Hannah. I work for these guys. I do their marketing, social media, all that good stuff. A little bit about me. I used to be a school teacher, a uh, school counselor, all that fun stuff. And uh, yeah, <laughs> this just give me all some, some time to log on. Um, we are aware that our sound could be better. Um, we have in, uh, invested in some new equipment that will hopefully be here very soon. Um, so that the acoustics will be a little bit better. You can hear us more clearly. Um, today we're going no microphone. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, so this is our live podcast slash vodcast, if you will. We'll be taking uh, listener viewer questions via TikTok. I'm monitoring the chat here, so if you ever have any questions, just drop them in and I'll kind of relay that information, whether it be at the end or if it kind of fits with what we're talking just naturally to weave it in there. Today we're sponsored by Starbucks. And today we're sponsored by Starbucks. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Wow, so many sponsorships in such little time. But with this kind of content, I mean, hey. we just, <laughs> I mean they're just, just lining up. knocking down the door. So we'll go ahead and get started today. I know we've got a lot to cover um, with what happened today in court. Um, Brian, I'll just let you kind of yeah. start us off. So today we got into the state's rebuttal case. And so, you know, the state's ability to rebut um, any kind of defense concepts is really supposed to be limited to the defense's case. It's not supposed to be new brand new material. It's supposed to be responsive to issues raised by the defense. And so, you know, right out of the gates, we had some kind of fiery exchanges going on between the first of the state's rebuttal witnesses who was Ronnie Crosby, so this is going to be a former law partner of Alec Murdoch, who was previously brought in to discuss the financial wrongdoings. And so he was brought in today for a little bit of a different reason. I mean, it was um, really to kind of rebut Alex Murdoch on a couple, I mean, on a couple different levels. And so, you know, Creighton Waters, his strategy and, and, and trying to prove his case or the state's case, you know, sometimes less is more, um, not for Creighton Waters. More is more for Creighton Waters. And that was apparent through all of Ronnie Crosby's direct examination. Basically every piece of lie that he could pick apart through this witness to contradict Alex Murdoch, he did, starting with um, even things about when you go hog hunting. Do you do it in the day versus doing it in the night? Alex Murdoch said that he normally does it in the nighttime. That's why he didn't have a rifle with Paul that day. So they, that that dispute right out of the gates was on. So every little inconsistency or lie, Creighton Waters is going to try to extract. Um, they also, yeah, yeah, well, just, and I was, I missed part of that because I was doing my hashtag day job, hashtag real lawyering, not just punditry, but, um, you know, those, the hogs do come out at night and those blackout 300s had thermal scopes for that purpose. So to, you know, that, that kind of, that evidence speaks for itself, but go ahead. Right. And so Dick Arpulian and Ronnie Crosby, you know, in Dick Arpulian's day job, when he's not a criminal defense lawyer, he's also a pretty well-respected plaintiff's lawyer. So the same kind of thing that Ronnie Crosby does for a living, uh, I think they have entirely different styles, but they do, both do major plaintiff work cases. So you got these two, you know, Dick, criminal lawyer, plaintiff's lawyer, Ronnie uh, Crosby, purely a plaintiff's lawyer, kind of battling each other here, um, which is fairly interesting. And, you know, trying to trip each other up and... Who's got more eight-figure eight settlements? Right, 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 right. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, it was very interesting. But Dick was trying to, you know, catch Ronnie Crosby up on the, on the concept that you know, of course you would be armed with a high-powered rifle um, if you were driving around with Paul, you know, because the hogs could be present and you wouldn't get caught with, with no weapon or a, a low-caliber weapon. You know, the whole, 
I guess line of questioning is to basically make it very likely that Alex Murdoch would have had a, access to a 300 blackout with Paul, potentially the missing murder weapon, um, where he was saying he was unarmed when he was riding around early in the day with his son. So that, I mean, that's, that was 15 minutes of when to hog hunt, when do you not hog hunt, you know, dangers of hog hunting, lots of swamp property in the low country. And it just kind of built up to their later fire exchange that we will get to. Um, ben Creighton Waters kind of, you know, walked this witness who not only was a, a financial victim of Alex Murdoch and the firm, but also had a personal relationship. And he basically said that Alex Murdoch never had any problems being friendly with law enforcement. He was very trusted by law enforcement, very cozy with law enforcement. And this was obviously to detract from Murdoch saying that he felt distrusting of SLED and that was the whole reason that he lied. They even went as far as to introducing a picture of this guy, David Williams, who was a prior SLED agent that in Alex Murdoch's opinion was involved in some inappropriate uh, investigation towards uh, one of his uh, sheriff buddies. And that was the whole reason that Alex Murdoch said that he kind of cooled with this other SLED agent, uh, David Owens, and he just getting the David's confused. So, you know, Craig Waters even goes ahead and says, now this isn't David Owens, is it? And so it was, it was kind of gratuitous, kind of how that played in front of the jury, I don't know. Um, but he went as far as to introduce that. He got out of him as well, that he was a, you know, a very good trial lawyer, and that he was theatrical, and that he could, the insinuation was that he could get into a courtroom in a closing argument and look the jury in the eyes and cry on command. That was objected to as being improper, you know, that kind of line of questioning. But, you know, Creighton Waters looked over to the jury as he was asking the question and said he could look at the jury and just fabricate tears. So fireworks were going, you know, Dick Carpootlin was already upset at this line of rebuttal witnesses. You know, I think yesterday was anticipated four rebuttal witnesses and then today it was seven and so reply witnesses, rebuttal witnesses. Um, and then, you know, our Putin just asked outright, you know, he was kind of being fed up with the uh, attacks on his client and said, well, do you think he did it? You know, that was a pretty bold move by Dick Arputlian, you know, because Ronnie Crosby could have gone anywhere with that. He could have been like, yes, I do. And that's it. Right. Like, yeah. that, that's a very risky, risky proposition because you, I mean, when you're cross-examining someone, you're asking questions in a way that lend themselves to one answer, yes or no. You're not always going to get that answer, but you don't just ask someone's opinion who you know is testifying now twice against your client who is a victim of his crimes. Do you think he did it? I mean, I like Dick Carpooling personally. He's not everybody's cup of tea, but that was a risky, risky proposition. And generally, lay witnesses are not allowed to give uh, an opinion on the ultimate issue. That's reserved for experts. But Dick just opened the door to that. So let's say Ronnie Crosby had said, yeah, I think he's guilty as homemade sin because he lied to me. He lied to my partners. He lied to these victims. And I've been sitting here as an educated lawyer, and I believe there's enough evidence to convict. And that would have been a bomb. I know what reasonable <laughs> doubt is. Crazy. And there ain't any. I've been watching this trial all day long. And Ronnie Crosby was a very likable witness in front of the jury. I think they, I think the, the jurors liked him uh, when he was up on the stand before. I think they liked him now. Um, so after escaping, falling off the cliff, so to speak, Dick Carpootlian then goes on to accuse Ronnie Crosby of being personally biased against Alex Murdoch because Alex Murdoch ruined his firm. Ruined it by stealing money, ruined it by having the partners have to pay back all this money, mm -hmm. they had to change the firm's name, and that he would have every bit of motivation to have an axe to, to grind against Alec Murdoch. Now that is, under our rules, a proper motive to cross-examine someone on any bias they may have, but it kind of backfired on this particular witness. I mean, he was a high-integrity, high-credibility witness. And you know, he was certainly prepared for that line of questioning. He was very well prepared um, for that. And he basically said, how dare you? You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I am not like, the inference was, I am not like Alex Murdoch. I don't lie. I, I take my oath very seriously. 
in this courtroom when I swore on the Bible. I take my, my oath as a lawyer extremely seriously. I've got a lot of integrity in this community, in the state, and anywhere else. Anyone ask anyone, ask anyone I'm not going to lie for anyone. So, you know, it was uh, kind of a, a fireworks right out of the gate witness, and I, I don't think it played very well for for the defense at all in the line of cross-examination, but I also kind of think it just showed the level that the state was willing to over-try this case. I mean, some of these witnesses they were they called today are gonna to be more important um, to counteract the defense's theories. This one was just a tit for tat, you know, anything you can do, I can do better kind of witness, but it, you know, it worked out pretty well for Creighton Waters, but the question is, how tired of this is, is the jury going to become of it? How weary are they going to be in having to rejudge credibility of these witnesses under basically the same line of questioning? So it definitely was a get the last word in type of witness. Um, Can y'all just yeah. go into detail about explaining uh, beyond reasonable doubt? You've got a good analogy for this, Luke that you like to use concerning football, um, but there's also a smell test. I don't know what's easier. Well, I mean, beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that caused a reasonable person to hesitate to act. And so we like to talk to juries and say, look, you're all reasonable. And of course the prosecutor will say, well, it's not proof beyond any doubt. <laughs> and I like to tell a jury, if you have a doubt because you are reasonable, then you cannot act to convict under our law. But like, if you think about cases, you know, if you think about a football field and 100 yards, let's say the end zone that you're running from, that's probable cause. You're in your end zone, you're moving across, that's what the state needs to arrest you. If you're in a civil case, as soon as you get across the 50 yard line, if you're the plaintiff proving your point, just a hair across, then you've met your burden. But in a criminal case, which has the highest standard in all the world, you essentially have to get through the end zone, right at the very end. You do any little celebration dance, you're spiking it if you can get there. Now it's not, the jury doesn't have to be convinced of the impossible. But again, like I, like I say, and I've been saying, a jury in this case cannot be left with, well, who else could it be? That's not appropriate. They have to prove in this case, beyond a reasonable doubt that he was there, that he did this, they're taking into account the lie, but also the lack of real animus or malice motive. Um, they have to consider the financial motive as it might be, um, plus no, no smoking gun, no blood, all those things. And, and then at the end of the day, I go, well, do I have a doubt? Now, I don't have any doubt about the financial crimes. He confessed to those and there's a paper trail, but, but do I have a doubt that he did this? Hmm. And that's the question. And if it doesn't pass that kind of, huh, our, our standard being the highest in the world should be an acquittal if a jury has that, huh, because you don't want someone to go, hmm, and then convict just because it's the easy thing. Because otherwise our system is, is lessened. It's debased. We want it to be the hardest thing in the world because the government has awesome power. And we don't want to have the cases where the government can, can convict even while a, a jury, a member, a body of our peers goes, huh? So that, that is the thing. It typically is meant to be a high burden. But the question is, with all this evidence, will the jury have a doubt or will they be firmly convinced? And if they're firmly convinced, then they, they render a verdict of guilty. Right. <clears throat> so the next rebuttal witness um, the state put up was Dr. Reamer again. This is going to be the state pathologist who was did really well for the state um, initially. I can't say that today. I, out of all the witnesses today, she was the most defensive. She seemed to be the most rattled. Um, you don't want that in your state medical doctor. Um, you know, we probably tried, you know, a lot of murder cases at this point in our career. And usually the state pathologists are pretty cerebral individuals. They're very sound in their 
um, analysis of the situation and cause of death, and they normally aren't rattled like this. She, Dr. Rima, really kind of even came out on direct and seemed pretty defensive. I mean, she was kind of already attacking the defense pathologist. So it, it started with the analysis concerning Maggie's wounds, and specifically the one that the defense uh, pathologist had an issue with was the one to the front of Maggie that Dr. Reamer said would have been coming up um, and then the back wound would have been coming down. So that, you know, that kind of inconsistent shot trajectory. And, you know, she kind of was very defensive about the defense's analysis. They both came from the same direction based on the defense pathologist's review of what we call skin tags. Um, and we all kind of learned about skin tags and how they can really you know, push out when a, when a bullet goes into skin, you know, they kind of push out almost like, like those old school bottle tops that when you open them up, there's a part that pushes back up at you. And so, I mean, you know, I thought the defense pathologist had some good points on that. And so she was kind of, the quotes I had written down from her is that I think he has a good imagination. So she, you know, you don't normally see medical doctors like this kind of start like that right out of the gates. Um, she was saying that skin tags sometimes are very helpful in determining directionality and sometimes it's just not very helpful at all. So she was kind of throwing it up there and she basically really said, listen, you know, the, any review of my autopsy report is not going to be as good as my autopsy. Um, looking at my report and looking at two dimensional photographs, it's just not the same. And you know, Experts are allowed to rely on each other. They're allowed to Monday morning quarterback each other. It happens all the time in forensic science and pathology. And, and generally a peer review process. Peer review process. That's the whole point of getting their expert status. So she said that um, the defense pathologist had a good imagination. She then moved on concerning Maggie and, and the discrepancy with the front wound. And then concerning Paul, she basically you know, was we got a wound here, I know Luke's gonna talk about this a lot later on, that has no stippling on the shoulder of Paul. You know, she would say the entry wound is the shoulder and the neck area coming up through Paul's head. And she basically said that if it were a contact wound, the way the defense described through their pathologist, that he basically would not have had, there would have been massive facial damage. She, her quote is, he would not have had a face left to even look at. Um, and the damage to his head would have been much, much worse. Um, you know, she, you know, Harpootlian and she had a very tense exchange and it just, she was a state witness that really for to, all the rebuttal witnesses that the state put up today, again, she was the worst. She really hurt her credibility on her first questioning by being so defensive. At one point, Dick Harpootlian had to ask the court to instruct her to answer the question because she was being so objectively evasive. Um, and I've never seen that in a state pathologist. I've never seen it. Um, she seemed very agitated. And again, witnesses get agitated when they're being challenged on the stand in front of an international community observing this trial. But medical pathologists don't get agitated. They just coolly, calmly reflect their report and the facts and the pathology as they see it. They don't get agitated. So she was very agitated. Um, Harpootling basically got her to say that there were notes that she took that she used in writing her report that were never turned over, which, you know, we all know that some, sometimes that gets turned over, sometimes it doesn't, but the jury doesn't necessarily know that. And so anytime there's, uh, discussion about things that are not turned over, it's meant to cast doubt on that witness. She says she, you shouldn't really follow those notes because they're not really in aid in how she gets to her conclusion. They're really a working kind of notation system that she uses that you should rely on her report, her final report. And so her said, well, all right, let's rely on your final report. You don't uh, observe or note in your final report the packing, the phone packing from Paul's shoulder that you are now testifying to for the first time about, you know, the pellets that are coming into this injury wound, as she would say, and that, you know, she explained that she's not 
a ballistics expert. She's not an expert in firearms, but she's aware that, you know, there's a lot of foam packing in between these pellets. And so she's basically noting packing here, observing it kind of live and testifying on the stand, but it's never in any of her notes and it was never in her report. And so Harpootlian kind of got her to admit, this is just an observation you're making for the first time to try to support your claim of an entry going up through the shoulder and into the head. And she had to kind of agree with that. Um, and you know, the way she kind of dealt with that was not a very good look for her, honestly. Um, Harpootlian also got her to admit that of all the autopsies, and you know, she was she's in the 5,000 range, I think it was 5,500, and she even said since the last time she was on the stand, the prior week, she's done a, you know, a couple more. So she's very busy, but you know, he got her to admit, I don't know if he knew this prior to her testimony or he just had a hunch, but he got her to admit, and of all the shotgun autopsies you've done where the wound, the fatal wound is to the head, how many of them have been non-self-inflicted wounds? Contact wounds. Con contact wounds, so otherwise, other than suicide, and she said, he said less than less than one, meaning zero. And she goes, yeah, probably. So basically, he got her to, to admit that she doesn't have a lot of experience in contact wounds to the head with a shotgun that are not self-inflicted. Luke, kind of talk a little bit more about your thoughts on how Dr. Rimmer did. I, I mean, I agree with your analysis regarding her being very defensive. I mean, the, the, you talk about a pathologist. This is like creme de la creme medical doctor. I mean, the, these doctors are just supposed to assert a cause of death. They're not really supposed to seem like they have a dog in the fight. I mean, they're not, you know, the police who can get really emotionally invested in your case. They're not the defendant. They're not a defense lawyer. I mean, every time we have a trial, they come in and talk very scientifically. They're doing, they're cutting open bodies and measuring and weighing in a, in a laboratory setting. They don't come out swinging. I think she got embarrassed. Um, she was almost sometimes as defensive as I saw Alec Murdoch, <laughs> you know, and as evasive, which is not really given the heat he has taken rightfully or wrongfully for the way he evaded and dodged. I mean, you don't want to see that in your pathologist. They're supposed to be the smartest person in the room. And so I wrote down a couple quotes. I mean, she says, well, hindsight is always twenty twenty. you know, regarding not x-raying the head, which would really definitively give her a better idea of pellets in there and perhaps the directionality of the shot. I mean, she did a lot of assuming, um, which is why she didn't shave the top of his head because she assumed it was an exit wound, not a, a entrance wound. And when you shave the head, you can see burn patterns and stippling consistent with a contact wound or not. That would have been the easiest way for her to rule that in or out. Um, she says, I don't know everything. And she basically admitted that there are other pathologists out there that are not, that have more forensic kind of ballistic gun experience and training than she does. And one thing that seemed to widely indicate that was, I mean, people generally know how shotguns work and that these pellets come out and spread out in a cone as they get, you know, out of the rut, out of that shot shell. And so she's describing a wide wound across the top of his shoulder at a 45 degree angle, but agrees that the hole that she says is the entrance hole in the, in the side of his head is, is more narrow than the wide wound on his shoulder. So that, that's the opposite. That would go into a PowerPoint. And that would be in a PowerPoint in my closing argument. That's a narrowing. That's inconsistent. So she just very defensive. It's not what you'd like to see. She kind of lost some of that professorial, calm, cool collectedness that she probably had in, in, the, in the first part of the case um, and because she's really rattled because she watched that other well-qualified pathologist who was the head of, of basically Georgia's sled like medical examiner's office um, basically tell her she was 180 degrees literally wrong. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Um, and definitely she came out swinging, but I don't know if it was a good look for her or not. You know, one thing that I found interesting is that she was very rattled by the learned, learned treatise from the, the Bible on shotgun injuries. I mean, the defense got a couple pages into evidence, and she couldn't really refute it. 
Um, she had to agree with it, but she also kind of called it theoretical. But I mean, that she was almost as defensive about the couple exhibits that were already in evidence that she was being walked through concerning the energy and the gas energy that causes, you know, in a head wound, a head contact wound with a shotgun, this kind of upward trajectory. But, you know, the funny thing was, is they got the first two pages they wanted in through evidence, but then later on they tried, you know, Dick Harpooling tried to get another page of this in through evidence. And uh, Savannah Good objected. I, I kind of feel like she wasn't sure why she was objecting at the time, but she objected and, you know, Cliff Newman says, all right, well, let's hear from everybody. And Dick Harpootlin got the rule and he had the rule and he was ready as a learned treatise. And he basically read the, the rule out loud that said, yes, you can kind of read it into evidence to impeach a witness. And generally it is, can be read into evidence. You can't admit it as an exhibit. And he goes, oh, my bad. I guess I did that wrong the past two times I've done it. And so it's just, you know, it was already in evidence, the two pages that Dr. Rimmer was having to live with and the, she was being re-examined on over and over and the jury will get it, but it shouldn't have come into evidence. So just an in interesting little sidebar on that, on that thing that got her so defensive. Um, any other questions as, as we move forward? Um, no, but the comment section is lively today. Um, we had a few questions of people wanting to maybe go back to discuss the hog hunts a little bit more in detail and like the different kinds of guns being used for that and how that could play into the defense's case and the state's case? Well, I think the general school of thought is that Alex Murdoch um, said that when he went out with Paul that day earlier, you know, they didn't have a firearm that you would need to defend against a hog attack or even kill hogs as you came across them. Um, which would be a high-powered AR-style weapon like the 300 Blackout. And that was kind of testified that they use those kind of weapons to hog hunt. And mostly that's done at night. That's what Alex Murdoch said, because he really wanted to say that the, the ride along with Paul was not really an armed ride, or certainly not armed with a weapon that could be used in this crime. It was meant to um, spend time with his son and go out and check the fields and check the trees and just quality time with his son. But I think that generally that, you know, a lot of the witnesses, even today, we got some financial witnesses that, you know, they all own property in Hampton County and they all hog hunt. It's just such a pervasive situation. So the hogs are aggressive, they tear up property, they, you know, so there, there's a lot of hog extermination going on and Luke has done typically with high-powered rifles. Absolutely. Um, so you can pick them off at distance. They are more, more nocturnal, but you can see them in the day sometimes. But I think, you know, we heard testimony about Paul always having a gun on him, mm -hmm. always. So I don't know that, I know, I can see why Murdoch didn't want to assert that he had a gun out there. And we know, you know, we know, if, you know, under my theory, if, if you're a murdering intentioned Alec Murdoch and you want to detract from the boat case, diminish it, and you want some sympathy to distract from an impending financial doom, just fake it some kind of accent out there on the land inspecting the feeders and all that just with Paul. So they just want to point out another way. <laughs> Where did this happen? <laughs> this on TikTok, some hat just flew on Somebody's down. decorating you with, oh, that, with a awesome. cowboy hat. <laughs> Great. I didn't know they had that ability. We'll see yeah. what happens. <laughs> so, <laughs> Keep them coming. So, um, I just, it's just another way to... Oh, no. It's just, a, it's just another way to show that Murdoch was inconsistent or maybe yeah. trying too hard. Um, but it would be very natural. And, you know, going hunting, when you're riding around on thousands of acres of land... You're just gonna want to have a rifle or at least something on you, some firearm. You come across a snake, you get some, you know, upset mama, mama wild pig with piglets who thinks you're a threat and charges you. I mean, just it wouldn't make sense that you're not gonna have any gun out there. So, but yes, in that part of the world, <laughs> um, pigs are prolific, and and you're always trying to shoot one if you can. Sorry, Peter. Um, <laughs> 
Let's talk more before we go into the next um, witness. Let's talk more about the jury going to the scene at Moselle. Um, a few questions here. Who all besides the jury will go on that field trip? Are there any chaperones? This is kind of what we want to know. Will Alec Murdoch be there? No. Okay, I mean, he will not. I mean, it's going to be a secured scene. So it's going to be isolation, but for law enforcement. Securing the scene completely and the jurors are not going to be they were instructed today that they're not allowed to Even ask themselves questions they are not allowed to start the, the deliberation process all for all these five six weeks The jurors have not been allowed to discuss anything they've heard in court now whether they've done that or not <laughs> Is another thing <laughs> <laughs> but they're gonna, um, man, I look good in that. In yeah. And that 10 gallon hat. Uh, <laughs> take out some hogs. <laughs> but whether they do that or not, you know, you hope they, they are, but they're gonna be in isolation <laughs> observing what's, there you go. what's going on. And, and, you know, hopefully the mental imagery will be, you know, present for them. They're gonna be able to kind of, any, any questions that they have, I guarantee you, the, all these witnesses have questions in their mind from the weeks of testimony about the layout of Moselle and they're going to walk it. Oh my gosh. We, I don't even know. What to think. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to have to um, let that play out, but it should be completely isolated. So it wouldn't be filmed. So like when we're watching no. crime television, we're not going to, no. we're not going to see that streamed. No. And uh, that's just not, not going to happen. So it'll okay. be a very kind of secure, insulated, um, sanitized kind of environment okay um and what are what are y'all's opinions or theories as to why the prosecution so strongly does not want the jury to go on this field trip they didn't sign the permission forms well to me it's because especially at the point that that motion was made i mean the defense was bringing all of the really illustrating diagrams, three-dimensional recreations, you know, trajectory analysis, and they were really piecing it all together. I mean, basically, the prosecution spent three-quarters of their case saying he's a liar and he's a financial thief, and they built a really interesting timeline that definitely puts him there, but they haven't explained in terms of trajectory or really anything other than expert Kinsey um, to say, why are we having with two different weapons? How do those trajectories inter interplaces? What's the position? What's the spacing? And so the, the defense is trying to, trying to illustrate this to say, could be two shooters, couldn't be him, he's too tall. And what the prosecution doesn't want is for a juror to stand around the place where the model was done and kind of think about whether based on their own height, like maybe they get like a six, five juror out there and go, he goes, huh, I don't think that really lines up. And he wants to like line it up. They don't want that. They don't want anything to feed into the theory. And so that's why, because that has not been the strength of the prosecution's case. Um, so right. it's, it's totally been the bad guy, liar over here. Therefore he did, he did the killing, uh, the, the financial crimes as a motive, you know, they, the state's kind of shown their true colors and not attacked it really as motive. Once it got in, it was all about credibility, not motive. So uh, this, the defense has been hyper-analyzing the scene as they should be trying to put reasonable doubt in this case. So yeah, I mean, the scene is going to be a place most likely where doubt could be found because the defense has been extrapolating theories from the scene and the state has not, other than Kinsey, who's been very effective witness. We'll, we'll talk about him a little bit more later. He's super intelligent, super local and, and folksy, and he's got a great personality and very, very intelligent, but um, he's their cleanup witness, but he's, he's responding in a way today, not so much disproving but um all right so the next witness we had was the former lo uh, longtime sheriff of hampton county and again this is kind of a creighton waters uh theme at this point is to respond to every lie or inconsistency about alex murdoch and so he was 
basically brought up there to say, hey, Alex Murak testified that you were one of the sheriffs that gave him permission to outfit his private vehicle with blue lights. Did you do that? And he said, no, I had no knowledge of that. And so Jim Griffin said, well, does no knowledge mean that somebody in your office didn't get permission? I can't say, I just don't know anything about it. And that was him. I mean, that was the point of that witness. Really. It just, if you're really trying to iron out that little caveat of information in mini battle between Waters and Murdoch, it almost feels like you're not winning. Because the whole theme of that by Waters was to say, you're privileged. Your daddy and your daddy before him and the daddy before him was solicitor in this county and you felt you could have a badge and you felt you could just install blue lights because basically you're law enforcement even though you're just a volunteer. And you're not. And that's just, you just think you can do whatever you want just to kind of make him look bad and seem entitled. Um, whereas uh, Murdoch, Murdoch said, uh, no, I don't. And this is basically a family heirloom, this badge. And also, you know, they all knew I was yes. getting these blue lights on my car because I'm just, yeah. you know, I'm a volunteer. And so, like, to basically try to defeat that point really doesn't have anything to do with the murder. It's just to try to make Murdoch look bad. He's saying, well, yeah, I mean, I like the lights and I got them installed just like everybody else. And I, I asked permission, so they bring in one guy that's, it's just an ancillary point, just a tit for tat. So, I don't know if you're arguing over that and not the timeline or murder weapon or blood spatter, then it just seems like a little petulant. <clears throat> Correct. My humble opinion. So the next witness was ridiculous. I'll just start by saying that. I'm not going to try to be objective. This was... Uh, a forensic analyst that previously tested his last name was McManigal. He previously testified that he was there to really make sure that anything that was attorney client related and confidential in Alex Murdoch's phone was not used in the investigation. And he's got training in cell phone extraction, etc. But basically, they Asked him, and I, you know, Luke is, hey boy, go in your office and do that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the guy in Kalafat is an expert in uh, cell phone forensics. Now, he's not a cell phone engineer, he's not any kind of engineer that should be doing any kind of crime scene, anything. I mean, he knows about phones generally, <laughs> but they basically had him in his office over the weekend, take a cell phone that he believed to be similar to Maggie's phone and not recorded and not with any other witnesses in his office. And he basically threw it over and over again and then decided not to collect any data on it, but just be able to remember and speak to a court about when it comes on and when it doesn't. And so <laughs> this was ridiculous. And, you know, I, we were a little bit disappointed in Mr. Barber, uh, who was questioning him today because, number one, he stipulated to his qualifications as an expert, but didn't really understand what they brought him up to testify for today. And so that was a problem um, because then kind of mid-testimony, uh, Attorney Barber was trying to, you know, object to that and, and, and you know, Judge Newman, rightly so, was like, listen, the, the horse is out of the, out of the stable. I mean, you stipulated to all this. Um, so you never stipulate on a, on a witness that's being qualified as, a, as an expert. You're gonna do the proper voir dire to see what he's qualified to testify about, what he's getting ready to testify in, and that can be exhaustive, but it's gotta be done. But bottom line is, Barbara did cross him in a pro in appropriate way and basically said what we were just talking about. You just did this test with no one around, and not didn't record it, then you screw the phone around, and you don't know anything about the engineering properties of a phone. Is that what I'm hearing? And he goes, "Yeah." And so Barbara should have walked away. Walk away. Walk away. <laughs> end on a high note. End on a high note. But then he he felt the need to continue. I mean, he had to win. He should have taken the win and gone back to his seat. But he didn't, and he kind of diminished 
a lot of his value in that line of cross, but it, it was just a ridiculous witness. I mean, it was it was ridiculous. And again, it was John Conrad getting up there, and so I kind of felt like it was a Hail Mary for the state trying to just throw a little gasoline on the fire, but the gasoline turned out to be water. I mean, it was not anything that the jury probably even, I mean, the, the jurors can do the same thing and back in, I mean, there's no reason for an expert to talk like this about this testing that wasn't even really a testing. Um, moving along, Mark Ball, um, kind of a short witness. He was very credible from the prior time that he testified, but basically he was just up there to you know, kind of talk about no credible threats of anyone else. They weren't worried about you know, anyone else. You know, so again, kind of impeaching Alex Murdoch concerning, you know, that. I mean, really, was there any other reason he was up there? I mean, what, was, what was he up there for today other than to basically say that the, the firm was um, not worried about any other threats. They just worried about, you know, maybe the firm being shot. I'm not really sure why else he was up there. He was not up there for a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. So it got him off pretty quickly. Um, I know Luke wants to talk a lot about, you know, Dr. Kinsley. You know, he's by far been the most credible expert for the state. Mm -hmm. The last time he testified, he was exceptional. He's probably the most charismatic expert witness on both sides. He's extremely knowledgeable. Um, and then we saw Alan Wilson. You know, so he's been in, in trial for the, all these five, six weeks. He's been interested in the proceedings, you know, with such a big microscope on this case. And he's the, you know, the attorney general. We were kind of wondering, is he just going to observe? And that's very common for them to observe. They're more political in nature than actually doing the trial work. Most, you don't see, you know, most attorney generals getting down in the trenches, but he did today. Now, granted, this was a training wheel witness, as I refer to it with my brother, because you don't need to direct him. He knows where he's going. So, but Alan Wilson did get up and start questioning him. Luke, you want to take off with this? Yeah, I mean, my opinion on Alan Wilson doing that is he probably doesn't want to be criticized for sitting through a four or five week trial and, and just being nothing but a, a passenger. So he, he, he knows this is the end, end of the case and he wants to make his mark. And he did better than I thought he, he would. Um, doesn't, I don't know how many trials he's ever tried, maybe none, but he's in an important job and didn't want it to be said that he didn't do anything. And certainly by this point, he's familiar enough with the case to get out there and go do it. So credit to him. I can understand why he, he did it. And I will say he probably did better than I thought he, he would. Did, he did way better than I expected. Right, Way so, better. you know, kudos. <laughs> but um, Ken, Kenzie is a very dangerous witness. And, you know, I, I, I'm cynical. I am biased. And as a defense lawyer, when I see a witness like that who tries to appear very folksy, yet also claims to be a PhD, and he is, in, like, criminal justice um, with this emphasis in crime scene recreation, I know that, I mean, he is a folksy guy, but that is only meant to win over juries, especially rural juries, and kind of juxtapose yourself to these, these big city expensive experts. They're flying in from Connecticut. Well, let me just pony up and tell you what I see. And I may not, I may not know you from a can of paint, but I agree with, you know, so like he's got all these folksy, folksy witticisms and all that, which in South Carolina, and whatever the witticism would be, if you're a local to Massachusetts up there, they may not want to hear from me. And I went to law school in Massachusetts. So, <laughs> um, but like, it's, it's part of the game. I mean, I, when, some, when I get a witness like that, I mean, I see right through that because I know how dangerous he is. And he, he is here, he's not independent, he's not objective, he's there to help the state. He does have this great scientific background. He can talk about blood spatter and volume and everything else. But he was here to kind of totally attack what the defense was bringing you. Again, the defense brought us contact wound from the top of the head on Paul versus this glancing blow under the head. And they want that because it shows, number one, the state is inaccurate. Number two, 
you can have this voluminous, spattery assailant who might also be stunned and not in a position to use the other weapon. Right. You know, uh, defense brought us two shooter theory, which always made more sense to me. Again, because you don't need a 30 uh, magazine capacity blackout 300. That's all you need. You don't need a shotgun plus that. Um, so they were really trying to push back on that. Again, they haven't really brought us a theory of one or two shooters or much crime scene just to say, we think he was shot here, Paul. We think she was shot over there. Um, so what I found fascinating and what I thought the defense did a good job with originally with the mechanical engineer Sutton is they're taking Agent Worley's measurements into the quail pen and into the doghouse, which gave us angle for the trajectory rods. And she's stick, sticking in rods and measuring, and then they're extrapolating out on a, a line to tell the approximate position of the barrel of the gun of the shooter in the approximate area of, let's say, where Maggie is. I don't know why SLED didn't even try to do that, but it's, you know, it's hard to criticize SLED's data, but Kinsley did. He basically said, well, we can't say that the angle of that trajectory is right because when you're talking about the quail pen, it's cardboard basically around the sides of that. And so he's like, I don't have confidence in that. It's not going to be a rigid structure like that doghouse. So, you know, you can't really even say that that line that Mike Sutton did on his, on his CAD drawing, you know, really even fits. But then on cross, um, thankfully, and I'm very critical of Jim Griffin on this, but he, he actually entered in or showed the photos of, of the trajectory rods, not just going to the cardboard, but it also went to the back of that quill pen into the And you would, you would think Kinsley would be completely aware of that. Well, he either wasn't or he was trying to minimize it, but that, that dowel, that rod, went through both sides of the cardboard and then into the hardwood. So it had a, a very distinct angle that Agent Worley was able to get out of that based on the landing point in the hardwood side of that hangar. So that, that was probably the best point that Jim Griffin made. But, you know, Kinsley got up and he stood and he's like, I can, I can, I can get on my knees, I can crouch, I can do this, I can do that. He's, he's like, it's all just dynamic. It's, it's just very, a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving parts. So they're very much trying to Hashtag squishy up. Um, what the defense has already said. Well, squishy, squishy up. Squishy up. Soften it. Soften <laughs> it. And so, but in part of that, I got a little annoyed because Mike Sutton, from my memory, didn't say hard and fast, this shooter is 5'2". What he said was, look, I'm looking at the general area of where Maggie's shell casings are. He's okay, like, gonna I'm going to get a 12, that's gonna a 12 foot radius, okay? That's the general area. We know that the shooter isn't up on the quail pen, and we know they're not 100 yards away that way. So if I put them generally in the middle of that 12-foot radius, well, where does the trajectory line draw out? And then he's, he's trying to figure out a reasonable shooting position. Sure, someone could crawl in like a Marine you know, infantry soldier going under barbed wire with a gun on their belly, or they could get out a ladder and stand up on that and then hold the gun at their feet. But he's just trying to figure out a reasonable shooting pos position, which is generally shouldered or maybe at the hip. And so it was a very damaging witness for the state. He really, the state, you can tell, is upset by the pathology testimony, the crime scene testimony as it relates to Paul, um, because they don't want it to seem... Like Brian said the other night, that if Alec Murdoch is a shooter, then he would be covered just in the tremendous amounts of blood and brain and bone. <clears throat> and Kinsley is very intelligent regarding this little bit, you know, and, and the blast and the gas causing that matter to come back up. You know, Kinsley, his quote today was, physics don't work like that unless you're shooting into a trampoline. Come on, man. How about that? You're better than that. You're smarter than that. So he was clearly, I mean, he had to have felt disingenuous when he said that. Shooting into a trampoline. Um, I mean, he, he, he's definitely trying to dispel any notion of a contact wound. 
He obviously talked about three dozen shotgun to the head cases he's worked. Um, majority of those were self-inflicted, but he just doesn't believe in, in what we heard from two defense experts about that with that contact wound, the physics of it, meaning all that pressure, velocity, energy into a confined space such as the head, that it's going to be looking for an escape route. And, and before the exit wound is created, the first escape route will be the way it came. He's trying to kind of all shucks that. Um, be very clever, very smart. It, you know, he'll be very particular in trying to help you know the state and establish their theory. But when you know Jim Griffin has shown him pellet, what would appear to be pellet marks on the concrete, which are consistent with the defense theory. Well, he just testified like, that there were no defects on the floor. Right. So if you so he showed him defects, and he's like, well, I don't know, it could be from a pressure washer. I, mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. I just can't say. It's very dynamic. It's very static. So here's my beef with this in general, and why I'm highly critical of Jim Griffin, he could have done more. I wanted to see more. As a, as a cross-examiner of a savvy, savvy witness, you will lose control if you don't have proper leading technique. Jim would, would gain some traction and then ask him an open-ended question. Like, well, why, well, why do you think that is? And you're just giving this opponent of yours who has a PhD the, the platform to opine in a way that hurts you. But... Here's the thing about Paul. The state and the, and the defense generally agree about the first wound. And we're gonna do some reenactment. And that, that is a wound that comes across the chest and hits the interior of the arm. And his arms are down, so Paul isn't expecting it. It's either someone he knows so he wouldn't expect to be shot, or he's just surprised. That is not the fatal wound. Some of that, of those pellets, go into the, into the window pane and beyond. But this is what I really wanted to see. We saw a pretty good demonstration with the Benelli shotgun by Alan Wilson, kind of to show and, and try to disprove some of what the defense expert they claim said. So, and the Benelli shotgun evidence is a classic example of a long gun, you know, hunting shotgun. It's not a sawed off shotgun, it's not a home defense pump shotgun with a smaller barrel, a shorter barrel. So. Here's what we know. Here's what I wanted to see from Jim Griffin. Can we act this out? Yeah. Hannah, let me get out of the way. And make sure you tell them how tall Hannah is. Let's... So Hannah, Paul is testified to be about 5'8". Hannah is 5'8". Five eight. Five eight. I'm about 5'10 and a half. Now, I did not have a shotgun in my office today. I didn't even have a measuring tape, but I've shot a lot of shotguns like that. And, you know, I'm just... Putting this into my shoulder, and to me, it feels about what you would have for a, a general standard long gun hunting shotgun. It's not perfect, but it feels pretty good. And you, you viewers can make up your own mind. So that's about the, the length of the gun you're gonna be working with. So if you'll stand a little bit back, Hannah, in that doorway. So my problem is this. You, they're saying the kill shot is coming across his shoulder and into the head. Now this shoulder wound is glancing. It has no stippling. So even Kinsey agrees that it has to be about two and a half feet away. Other experts have, have said three for an intermediate shot. You have to be further than three. My experience in trials and, and cross-examining pathologists is anything closer than three will give you stippling. <laughs> anything closer than three will give you stippling. Further away will not. So we know this wound Let's just say, for Kingsley's sake, is two and a half feet away, because that's what he said today. All right, if you'll step kind of, I like the door frame in the background, but we'll yeah. just do it this way. We want to just adjust our, our view. Hey, everybody. All right. So my problem is, it's a 45 degree angle. Just step up a little bit. So let's approximate that. This is, we can say that's 45. Obviously, this is 90. And this is the wound that comes across and hits like that for the state. But with no stippling on that wound, I mean, stop me at 45 degrees when I get to two and a half feet, you're, you're butting into the floor. The butt of this hypothetical shotgun is in the floor and I'm not two feet away. So I really wanted Jim Griffin to demonstrate as Alan Wilson did, it's a very weird and improbable shot to make 
on Paul where you have, I'm not even two and a half feet away and I'm, I'm hitting the floor. So why is your assailant going to do a kill shot like that? Now they don't say that Paul was crouched or kneeling or falling because they like what they see on the top of this door frame, which is blood spatter, hair, things like that. Now the fence again says that's from blowback. But this is not a realistic shot because your butt of a normal longer right or shotgun is hitting the floor. Why is your attacker going to be like this to make that shot? It doesn't make any sense to me. So I really wanted to see Jim Griffin try to go that route. He did not. And he really missed an opportunity. But the state, through Kingsley, who is a very effective, homespun, local expert, he got to kind of um, laugh at the fact that the out-of-town experts got paid so much and, you know, just make little jokes. But, like, that was the point that really needed to be fleshed out, and it was a missed opportunity for defense. And that was my burning question throughout this entire trial as soon as I heard the state's theory. <clears throat> the kids that also, you know, was very dismissive of the two-shooter theory, um, you know, basically... You know, just trying to act like, you know, that was crazy. Um, you know, that certain, you know, but here's the th one thing I wrote down. You know, I think it was Creighton Waters or Alan Wilson said it's always been the state's theory that there were two guns. So we're hearing that for the first time in the entire trial, not an opening, not the reading of the witnesses, but today it's always been, I, I think, um, it was a redirect by Alan Wilson that was objected to about regarding the the two long guns. And Alan Wilson kind of, he basically said, listen, judge, I can get into this. They're trying to diminish it. And it's always been the state's theory that, you know, there are two guns, not two shooters. And so that was something that was brand new for the first time. And so then, you know, Kinsley had to kind of deal with that. Um, and kind of say, well, you kind of like, you, you access what's available to you. I'm not, you know, whatever's there, you can just grab. And, you know, it doesn't make any sense for, you know, basically, you know, one shooter to operate two long guns. But like, that well, was... What, what I got objected to was them trying to get in some testimony, which really exceeded the reply case, was right. getting back to Paul Greer and, and really establishing that this Blackout 300 is a family gun due to the markings, the cycling through marks around Maggie matching what's in other places on the farm. But that was not something the defense contested in their case. So that really properly did exceed the scope, but it was, objection was overruled. <laughs> and anyway, that's just a, a but, little... the, but the interesting point is the, the state, now that the attorney general has said in open court in response to an objection in front of the jury, the state has always contended there were two guns basically used by one shooter. You have to, I mean, that that's built in reasonable doubt. I mean, I think about Rambo, right? You know, First Blood, the old 80s movie. And he's got both guns and he's, he's going to town on law enforcement. That is what they're saying Alex Murat was doing. Right, well, it was always kind of implied like, hey, well, we're only we're only charged Mr. Murdoch, and we've got these two weapons that were used, so he clearly had two guns. But it's never been outright said. But you know, it, that's the that's a piece of reasonable doubt, like Brian Riley says. Why do it? And I guess one theory is to make it look like there's two shooters, but it's just such an awkward thing. And we know from that that video down there that you have a very normal kind of family conversation about Bubba and the chicken and all that. It's the very, it really isn't a whole lot of like, Daddy, why do you have these guns uh, locked and loaded right now at your side? Where, uh, why do we need that to deal with the dogs in the kennel? So it's just, I have questions about that. But very interesting day from the prosecution. Um, they ended with a very strong witness. I think there was a moment when the, the defense was like, well, what about a, a sir rebuttal? Like, we want to respond to some of this. And then Newman said he wasn't inclined to make a ruling at that time, which Newman likes to do. He likes to wait until it's what he feels is the appropriate time. And then when the state rested on their reply, he asked Harpootlian, well, do you have any argument? And 
And Art Bootlin and Jim Griffin just kind of looked at each other and, and said no. I mean, they're exhausted. I mean, we've been exhausted just watching it and talking about it. So, but it seemed like they had thought about maybe putting something up and then just kind of said, well, screw it. We're done. <clears throat> we ready for some questions? Yeah, sure. All right. Some people are wanting to know about an email that was sent today and I wasn't able to watch, you know, all of the hearings today. So I'm not really sure what email people are talking about. There was a reference to an email that Judge Newman read, but there's been nothing publicly on the record said about the contents of the email. So we're all in the dark. I'm sure that all the reporters in Walterboro on the ground are contacting their sources right now trying to figure out what that is. I mean, it could be an email concerning a member of the jury, a security threat. It could be timing of the Moselle scene and what law enforcement believes will be the best way to secure that scene. It could be a hundred different things. We just don't know at this point. Um, again, people are so stumped with motive and I know that the state tries to maybe claim it is a distraction from financial wrongdoings um, or that perhaps this is tied somehow to financial wrongdoings. Can you all go into more detail, kind of your opinions about that take? My opinion is that that assertion by the state to say that they had to get into the financial crimes, the confrontation that day of malfeasance, and everything else is really not motive. Um, it was disguised as motive. But once it was actually used, you could see what they were doing with it to say, you're a liar, you're a bad guy. When you testify, this jury should not believe you because you lie. I mean, those are typically the types of evidence that our laws and rules are designed to prevent. I think if we had had some life insurance information or adjusting the policies or some way to really link some other problems amongst the family. I mean, we heard some evidence that they're aware of his pill usage, but really were just kind of supportive and concerned and hopeful that it was over. So I worry as a taxpayer <laughs> that we've wasted a lot of time if the state secures a conviction between that and the attempted suicide evidence, which is very prejudicial Either whether you claim it's the defense lawyer's problem or not, that's called post-conviction relief. If your lawyer was ineffective and opened the door due to that ineffectiveness, then that can also be grounds for a new trial. So I, I as a neutral, I, I like a clean trial. I like a fair trial. Um, and I don't like to see someone's other terrible, poor decisions in their life, which he will be tried in another court, be about three quarters of the evidence in a murder case. So I don't really think it's true motive. I think the, th the state cleverly figure out a way to say it was motive when really it was just, you're a bad guy type evidence. So that is what's baked in at this point. If there's a conviction, nine out of 10 times, it's coming back on appeal and we will be trying this case again in about five years. And I'd like to make a point on the appellate issues. You know, normally a murder case or something like this would be tried by a circuit solicitor's office, like Duffy Stone's office. But because of the conflict, it went to the attorney general's office. Uh, SLED investigated because of the conflict and the attorney general's office prosecuted. Now appeals in South Carolina you know, once there's a conviction and a defendant appeals, the prosecuting agency that handles the appeals for the state in South Carolina, for you national and international viewers, is the Attorney General's office. So normally when Luke and I are trying cases against the Attorney General's office, they're more cerebral about what they try to force into evidence because they know that the attorney down the hall from them in the appellate division is going to say, hey, what are you doing? I'm and in this case, it's the guy with the beard sitting right behind Adam Right, Wilson. Don Zelenka is right <laughs> there. So, but, so normally the attorney general's office isn't trying so hard to build a record for appeal where they know they're going to have to secure a conviction again in four or five years when it comes back. But as we heard today for the first time, the man 
calling the shots, the big boss, Alan Wilson, directing witnesses and dealing with objections, wants to, at whatever cost, secure a conviction for his office. And they're really not, for once, they're really not considering appellate issues. So take it for what it's worth. So at this time, we are kind of wrapping up, but we will be taking viewer questions. So if you have any other like burning questions that you want to know, drop them in um, the comment box here um, and we'll get to them. Um, but in the meantime, someone had asked, I believe this was last night, but they wanted to hear each of you give your idea for the three best points that the state has made versus the three best or strongest the defense has right now. Take some time to think about it if you'd like. Uh, well, I'll jump. Luke's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do this on the fly. Well, three best points are kennel video, which is, I mean, that's just the, yeah. that's 80% of the case is kennel video because you lied and you were right there before an objective kind of uh, phone based time of death. So you got kennel video, you've got, um, really this very narrow timeline and I will say Kinsey himself was a very good witness to try to put their stamp on the the crime scene for the defense I think um, the Mike Sutton recreation just extrapolating that real trajectory that introduces a very short shooter inconsistent with 6'4 as not, not to the exclusion of all possibilities, but just to, within the realm, the zone of the shooting for a natural shooting position. Um, I would say the cell phone evidence of Maggie's phone taking steps while Alex's phone is, is, is not taking steps. And then there's this time period where the, the state's own witness said no. One person could not have those at the same time. And I'll throw you a wild card and say Alec Murdoch snot um, as being, again, I, I had a lot of, I'm sure, I'm sure most of the world thinks he's a narcissistic sociopath. But I've had a lot of clients testify. Some really struggle to present the necessary emotion. Some probably go over the top and you can tell their practice and have some tears. I will say his snot on command is something I have not seen before. So I will just throw that out there as a, as a thing for the defense. And I'll just say for the state, I mean, I'll go number one, kill video. That's the aha moment for the state. That's the big lie that it kept going over and over and over again to all of his friends, all of his law partners, all through law enforcement, and even against the dual violation that we have a whole podcast on you know, a couple days ago, you know, the state was able to infer that he manufactured that lie about being, you know, the reason for the Kindle video lie in court because he's a savvy traveler. So the Kindle video, and then broadly for the state, financial crimes, financial crimes, financial crimes, that's going to overwhelm the jury, make them hate this guy, make him, make them want to wish he was buried under the prison, and then the suicide. You know, suicide is an extremely personal thing. That's why it's so prejudicial under our case law. That's why Judge Newman initially kept it out. And then for whatever reason, whether you agree with the legal ruling or not, Jim, Jim Griffin walked the line um, and it all came in. So kennel video, you know, financial crime, suicide. For the defense, you know, I, I'm all about, obviously there's no blood. No blood, no blood, no blood. Everyone's talking about the blood, and Alec Murdoch has no blood. I would, I would be harping on the fact that you can't have a guy that's such a sloppy financial criminal, and yet a master killer with no blood, all planned out. That's difficult to overcome. That's reasonable doubt. Um, the phones, when you're, you know, I think there's a lot of credible evidence to show that when both the phones that Paul, or excuse me, Alec Murdoch had and Maggie, he couldn't have been holding them at the same time. I think that was kind of demonstrated through the witnesses pretty well. And then I, you know, I was a really big fan of both the defense pathologists and their crime scene expert. I thought were almost 
super credible, unassailable in terms of their backgrounds, but they've made a real credible case for a contact wound from the top of Paul's head, which you know would totally negate the state's theory of that really low angled shot. Um, so those are the, those are the three big points for the defense. Um, we got some more questions that came in. Oh, our poll just ended. Uh, that's cool. I didn't know we had a poll. What yeah, did we poll? We polled um, <laughs> if people believe Alec to be guilty or not guilty. Uh, so we got 65% say yes, guilty, and then 34% voted not guilty. Hmm, surprising. Very, very interesting. Um, okay, what about the deleted phone calls on Alec's phone? Why do you think that's not a bigger focus? Before we jump into that, if you viewers are our jury and 30% say not guilty, then that means we're 60, it? It's 60% guilty, um, 30 or 65. Okay. And then obviously the rest. Then so obviously that, that expresses a certain amount of doubt that probably would end up with a hung jury in this case if you guys were our jury. So anyway. The guys that are voting guilty are like, no, no, <laughs> redo the poll, redo the poll. Um, so yeah, going back to the deleted phone calls on Alex's phone. It's a bad look. Um, he had no, this has been a bad look. It is, right? But he had no real good explanation for that other than perhaps a frantic, unintentional, you know, fat finger, you know, just like the Whaley's search of the seafood restaurant, which really doesn't make any sense. But, but when you piece together from the other side of who he called, they weren't. There was nothing, there's no smoking gun there other than kind of normal call patterns, but maybe in his panic, if you're a guilty Alex Murdoch, you, you think, well, I don't want to, um, out of abundance of caution, I'm just going to just wipe out some stuff. But what, I mean, the phone calls to his family, to Buster, his brother, I mean, it really didn't, there wasn't anything crazy there to hide. So you kind of wonder, well, why would you do it if it was just kind of routine, driving to Almeida calls and things like that. So... But his explanation was not great. Right. Everyone wants to know about Cousin Eddie. And Brian, I'm going to let you take this because I know that you were really holding out to hear from Cousin Eddie. What do you think would have come from that? What were you hoping would have been revealed throughout Cousin Eddie taking the stand? I think too, uh, Cousin Eddie got too hot to handle for the state. But I think they would have had him prepped for a real revelation of kind of a, an admission of doing the crime or either an insinuation that he had done the crime and that's why he wanted I mean, assistance. not that Eddie had done it, but that he had... That Al Murdoch had murdered his family. family. And I think that yeah. my gut is that they had him ready to go to really infer a guilty conscience. I mean, that's the whole reason to kill yourself. That's why in murder cases, suicide is so prejudicial under our case law. Because it infers that there's a, a guilty conscience, a guilty inference that you did this. And the jury will get an instruction from Judge Newman that you can infer guilt by the fact that he tried to attempt suicide in this case. So I think they had Cousin Eddie lined up to be that witness, to really, but I think whatever, I think he got sideways with the state. I think maybe he wanted more than they were willing to give him in terms of well, what's going to happen after I testify. I honestly feel that's my gut on that situation. They had, and I think they had every intention of putting him up as a witness, but he got too out of control. And I think they then used the other witnesses, like the, the investigator on the roadside shooting, to kind of get out what they needed through him in a more <laughs> law enforcement professional way. I just think anything could have come out of Cousin Eddie, but I think what they were hoping would have gotten out of him was an inference of guilt to his family's killing and why he did it. The timeline when Alec Murdoch pulled into the property and dialed 911, so is that 20 seconds between when his car was put in park and then dialed 911, correct? I think, I think that's yeah. right. Okay, walk us through how realistic that seems. Because <clears throat> he's saying that he rolled bodies over, checked the bodies, got out of his car, yeah, all, all the things. I think it's, it depends on if you believe Alex Murdoch or not in the fact that he 
called 911 before he assessed how bad it was and rolled over Maggie and Paul's body. So he testified that he basically saw them, knew it was terrible, called 911, jumped, at, jumped out of the car, jumped out of the car, and at, you know, as a, a a husband and a father, I, I can understand that. Just seeing who you know is to be down there, your family on the ground, you're gonna call 911 and, and and try to assess it as they're down. So if you believe Alex Murdoch, I think you find that to be objectively credible. I think if you don't buy it and you think that he would have needed to kind of assess them and roll them over and you got these other witnesses that are going to have testified even today with Ronnie Crosby that I'm, he said, I'm pretty certain that he represented to me that he rolled them over and checked them and only then called 911. So it's just what you believe. You got to, it, it kind of hinges on Alex Murdoch's credibility on that issue, what you find believable. But I think, you know, certainly plausible if you think that only your family's at the residence and you and you drive up to their location and your high beams or low beams are on their bodies and you recognize their clothes and everything else and you see blood that you would call 911 so that it just hinges on if you believe Alex Murdoch or not which is again you, how you believe him and how you assess him is in the light of the financial crimes and the suicide evidence you got to take all that in, and so that's why I'm sure Don Zelenka is in the courtroom taking notes. Well, right. Imagine a, a trial, a world where you don't have the financial crimes and evidence, you don't have the attempted suicide evidence, and you have a prosecution nitpicking about whether on his 911 call or a sled interview, he said he checked the bodies first or he called 911 first. Then, in that world, you can be like, well, geez, guys, he's just seen most of his family slaughtered, Give, cut the man some slack for maybe not his perfect recollection or panic or whatever. But when you don't have that world and you have tons of lies and financial crimes, then it allows the state to say, well, he's just, it's too convenient. He's a lying liar versus a man who's traumatized and just found his family and just can barely tell head from tail. So that's... Yeah, so what Creighton Waters has been saying to the jury is interesting. You know, good lawyers... When they cross-examine witnesses, they actually are testifying. And I don't consider Craig Waters to be an exceptional cross-examiner of a witness. I've kind of gone over that often defendants don't testify, and so prosecutors aren't as experienced on that. But Craig did a good job of basically testifying to the jury, saying, you are an experienced, it's easy for you to lie, you're convincing when you lie. And he was able to look at the jury as he was cross-examining Alex Murdoch and really connect with the jury about those lies and how easy and convincing Alex Murdoch is when he lies. I think we'll finish today, one, by shouting out Bubba. We are big Bubba fans here at the Sheely Law Firm. <laughs> um, and second, going through again, we've kind of done this every night, but you know, after seeing everything that happened today, uh, dissecting all of that, giving your thoughts on whether you believe Alec Murdoch to be guilty or not guilty. We'll start whoever wants to jump in. Guilty or not guilty or what the jury's going to do. I want to give us both, but the, pe the people want to hear from you personally, I, what your personal opinion is. I still believe that he did not pull the trigger, but I believe he has a really good idea who did and that he's been lying throughout the trial concerning his true understanding of probably who did this. I think that's a lie. I think the, the kind of defense of it had to be related to the boat accident and kind of media being whipped up, uh, the, the citizens being whipped up by a media storm. I think that's for the trial. I think, it, I think he really knows what was going on. The big cousin Eddie payments the massive amount of money that was being stolen, something bigger is happening. And I don't, you know, the trial is supposed to be a protected, insulated place where someone's presumed innocent and all these prejudicial things are supposed to be kept out of the trial. But, you know, I have to, knowing everything I know and maybe even just knowing what the jurors know, I think they probably believe there's something greater. But I don't think he's the shooter. And I don't think he intended on having his family killed 
I don't think there's enough there. There certainly is not enough motive. Mm -hmm. And I think there's enough doubt in the, in the defense case about two shooters and the trajectory, trajectory and the timeline that we've kind of been dealing with. I just don't think he did it. I think there's a very strong possibility he's going to get found guilty due to the overwhelming prejudice of the financial crimes and the suicide and his own lies, the things that are coming out of his mouth. But, but I don't think he actually did it. I, that's my opinion too, and it's it's based on the lack of motive of real what I would say real motive. I mean, when you see snot, I don't think those are crocodile tears. You, you know, I I have represented and seen lots of cases where a husband kills a wife in a domestic circumstance. That wife is not blood. You know, he's not part of your, that. You know, Paul is part of his genetic makeup. I see child cases um, where young parents will be frustrated and, and shake their baby out of frustration. I very rarely see cases where adult men with no domestic history would kill their adult sons. I mean, you don't see that as much, especially when there's not a real clear, linear motive for that. Um, because, I mean, that's, I mean, I have a son. And so it's easy for me to put myself in that shoe and without, I've seen people who are mentally ill kill family out of the blue for no apparent reason. Like, I'm not just talking about a narcissist. I'm talking about schizophrenic, um, a, a dissociative break from reality and that we don't have that evidence. So I think it has to do with the money. It has to do with what he got in over his head with. And I think he feels responsible. I think he knows exactly probably who did it. And to say the truth, he might think doesn't get set him free or it might just be so, might be the proximate cause of his family's death um, in kind of legal terms. So I don't think he pulled the trigger, but I think like Brian says, I think he knows who did. It has a lot to do with that $500,000 to Cousin Eddie Smith that is not for Oxy. And I still think he, I think we're about 70% guilty in terms of the verdict, 30% hung jury, 0% not guilty. Um, and if it's a guilty, I think we're 100% new trial based on a lot of reversible error in this case. Awesome. Well, that concludes our live for today. We will be back again tomorrow. Um, you'll catch us right after court adjourns. We'll pop on live, be taking questions, discussing in detail everything that goes on tomorrow. Um, we really appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, I personally love interacting with you guys in the comments. It's been really fun. We enjoy doing these. And we are still thinking of a name, correct? Or have we decided? <laughs> so, we just blew it. We, we, well, let's not float it. Let, let's agree. Maybe there should be it's, podcast name. Let, we will have a name announced by tomorrow. We got to huddle up a little bit more. I don't want to float anything just yet. We don't want to do this live. That, but we, it's too we, much pressure. We've been giving it considerate thought, considerable thought, and I think we'll have it ready by tomorrow. Yeah. All right? All right. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you again tomorrow. This was brought to you by Starbucks. <laughs>